All right, guys. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Nick McSpadden. Um, I'm the Client Systems Manager at Schools of Sacred Heart in San Francisco. We're a collection of independent schools, about 1,000 students, 250 faculty and staff. I manage about 600 Mac laptops and desktop workstations, and now about 800 iPads. Um, but we're not talking about iOS today. We're talking about one of my favorite aspects of being a Mac admin is managing labs. I work in an educational institution, and of course, the computer lab is the source of great struggle, tears, sadness, and joy and learning at the same time. Um, and as we all know, uh, leaving a computer in its default state and putting it anywhere near the hands of children is a recipe for horror and destruction untold. We want to avoid that. So this session is going to be about starting up a lab, configuring computers to work in a structured, controlled environment such that we can determine some settings that we want our users to have provided for them by default, um, and also to pre prevent users from going through and changing the settings that we've established. And we'll be using a variety of tools for that. Before we start, how many people currently are in a similar environment to me where they, you know, they have to deal with a computer lab, whether in education or for anyone? All right, so great. How many people here are familiar with Deploy Studio? I love it. This is great. How many people are familiar with Monkey? OK, that's not as important for this. Um, how many of you uh, have already used, in some degree, some method of OS X servers management or work group manager, things like that? OK, great. This is going to be old hat for you guys, then. This is going to be great. So we're making a computer lab. Our administrator just bought 50 new Macs and wants to make a shiny, nice, bright spot of learning and joy for the students. So obviously, one of the first things we have to do is we have to deploy OS X. We're not going to talk too much about deployment methods. That's being discussed left and right all over this conference, and there's plenty of sessions about that. Um, but you know, obviously, the, the proper method of deployment is going to be an important consideration when you're setting up a computer lab. Uh, next, we have to think about what kind of software we want to install, how we want to install it. And the fun part that we're going to talk about today is how we're going to determine the kind of settings and controls that we want to use for our users. Um, and then, of course, we want to, you know, if we, if we have local user accounts, we're going to want to create those. And then we want to finish everything off with having a single workflow that can deliver all of our changes, all of our preferences in one go. So that way we take a machine, we plug it into our process, we hand it off, it's done. Beautiful. So just a word on deployment. All of you mentioned you're, you're familiar with Deploy Studio, basically, so this probably isn't a whole lot of new stuff. Um, I would like to put a plug in for one of my favorite tools, Create OS X Install Package, which we can actually demonstrate. I believe it's, uh, it's on this computer here, which I'll show you. It allows you to generate an installer package of Lion or Mountain Lion, uh, which behaves the same way that uh, when you download Lion or Mountain Lion from the App Store and you get the, you know, the app that you double click, it's the exact same process that that goes through. It installs Lion that way. Um, I'm not really going to talk about it at all, but there are other tools like InstaDMG, which I'm sure you'll hear discussed in other sessions about deployment. Um, it's one way to create images for you to use uh, for your preferred deployment strategy. And uh, I did mention Monkey, and some of you are familiar with it. It's a method of delivering software, delivering packages to client machines. Uh, it's my preferred method for getting things from my giant repository of software to the user's hands. Uh, we're not really going to talk about it too much, but um, whatever method you've got for deploying software, whether that's Apple Remote Desktop, Monkey, any of the hundred other options out there for pushing packages across, um, the really important thing is that we want to be able to standardize around the Apple package format. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with you know, the, the PKG formats, what everything Apple ever gives you pretty much comes in a package format. And we're going to be spending some time doing some packaging. I'm actually going to skip this slide for the moment. All right. Uh, we did talk about Monkey a little bit, but um, I'm going to put another plug in it here. It's a great tool because, for one thing, it's free. All it requires is a web server. Um, and it's a, t it's a client you install on OS X, which communicates with your Monkey web server and pulls packages down from your repository and installs them according to whatever manifest you specified. This is a great way for us to get software that we've packaged together into the workstations. Um, it's, it's a very straightforward and very, uh, very powerful way of configuring exactly how all the machines look. And you can use this together with things like Deploy Studio to create never-before-booted, 
fully deployed machines in one single run. That's what I do, and I love it. Um, again, InstaDMG offers a similar functionality. You can create big, you know, big honking images that have all your stuff pre-packaged and you know, preset into it, and then you can use your image deployment like Deploy Studio to copy this into all the machines. Um, so there's that, there's that way of doing it as well. Um, one big thing about deploying OS X, as I'm sure everybody here has probably struggled with at some point, is that not all software comes in a friendly format. Sometimes vendors give us Vise installers, or they give us random scripts that install a bunch of files in random places, or you know anything that Adobe does is pretty much guaranteed to make you suffer. <laughs> um, so a lot of times we'll have to go through repackaging, where we have to take the installer that they provide, take it apart, find the pieces, and we put it together in our own package, which we can create an Apple-friendly PKG file, which we can then use with Monkey or whatever other deployment method you've got in mind. We generally want to avoid repackaging if we can, because every time you reinvent the wheel, there's a chance you might make a mistake. You can get a spoke wrong, and the wheel explodes, and we don't want that. All right, So we, we want to try and avoid this if we can, but sometimes we just don't have a choice. Um, there are some ways to get around installers that really, really suck. We can do a trick called snapshotting. There are a number of tools for this. Jamf Composer is one. Uh, I think absolute manage install ease, which is pretty much abandonware at this point, but it still works, lets you take a snapshot before and after you install something, and that will tell you all the files that were changed or added. So that's one way of creating packages. So these are things that we may have to learn how to do as lab managers when we want to create images and deploy software. Um, there are a number of different tools for creating packages. The one I like is the one just called Packages. It's a free download. Um, you can you know, Googling packages does not give you the result you'd expect. It really, yeah, it's not very helpful. Google Iceberg, which is his other packaging program, which will get you to the website where you can find packages. There is a copy of it. I've copied it to all the computers in front of you, um, so all the machines have it right now. Um, and uh, Luggage is also a popular way for people to create Apple-friendly packages. Um, it's a little bit arcane, so if you're not familiar with it, um, it's, it's, you know, it's definitely worth learning about. Um, but, you know, it, it allows you a lot more power and a lot more versatility, but it also has a higher learning curve. Um, and, of course, you know, for Adobe software, they have their own enterprise deployment tools. Um, anybody who's familiar with CS5 and CS6 has probably run into AMI, and now they have their new Creative Cloud Packager, and it, yeah, we're not dealing with that at all today because it takes forever to do anything with Adobe. So, we want to take a look at the kind of things we want to control on our lab max, okay? We want to control system level preferences. We want to potentially control things at the user level. And in some cases, we also want to change how certain applications behave. We want to provide defaults for the way certain programs act. So at a system level, some obvious things that come to mind, right? We want to change the energy settings so the machines don't fall asleep every five minutes, which, by the way, these machines will fall asleep in five minutes. I noticed that when setting up. So just, if you don't touch your keyboard, it'll go away. Um, we might want to change Apple software updates. We want to change the schedule or what Apple software update URL they access. Maybe they want to access our internal server, not Apple's catalogs. Um, network settings, of course. Uh, the way the login window behaves. Directory services is obviously a really big one. Um, just as a word, AD and OD, Active Directory and Open Directory, that's outside the scope of this session. We're not going to talk about binding to anything like that because we obviously don't have an Active Directory server here to play with. Um, and it, it's a whole bag of worms on its own, can of worms, bag, a bag of cans. Um, so we're not going to really deal with that a whole lot, but you know that is something that you might want to have to work with uh, when setting up your lab, uh, of course. Now at the user level, okay, the user level really affects the experience that the user has when they log in. So we might want to control things like how, you know, when the screensaver comes on, does the screensaver lock? Is the screensaver controlled so they can't change it to a set of pictures from their iPhoto library so that they load up full of puppy and cat pictures and confuse the kindergartner who comes in after them? Um, we might want to constrain, we might want to change how the finder behaves. Do disks show up on the desktop? Does the sidebar have these items? Things like that. All that can be managed through preferences. Um, and of course, certain applications, um, Microsoft Office being a big one. You know how when you first launch Office 2008, 2011, it goes to the big first run process and takes a million years and it's just really annoying and pisses everybody off? That can all be managed. That preference can be gotten rid of and you can set MCX preferences or profiles that take all that away so that the very first time a user logs in and opens it, they get a Word document. 
It's glorious. Okay, and of course Adobe, iLife, iWork, all of, pretty much all of Apple's software is generally very friendly to managing uh, their preferences. Not all vendors are, so it's really going to be kind of you're just going to have to figure it out which which applications that you have really work and which don't. Just about everything on the Mac that uses preferences stores those preferences in P lists. Or is everyone here familiar with the property list? In general, I mean, like, so when I, when I say the P list, you have an idea of what that means. It's, it's an XML document that contains a series of keys that contain a series of values, and programs read and write these keys to determine how it should behave, okay? Just about everything on OS X uses P lists. Um, not all P lists that are in existence can be managed. Some can, some can't. It's just, yeah, it's just kind of random sometimes. There are ways to figure out what P lists you're looking for. Um, sometimes you have to sort of dig around for what preference file you're actually trying to work with. Um, you can use a program like FS Eventer, which is a free download, or the command line utility FS underscore usage, which is, uh, well, it's the nuclear option. It's kind of like sandblasting a soup cracker when you're looking for one single file. But it'll show you every single file system event that's happening until you stop it. It's, yeah, it's pretty powerful. Um, once you've determined what kind of files you're trying to work with, which plists you need to access, um, you can use a packaging program to incorporate these kind of settings and changes, and then you can deploy these to other client machines very easily. So the whole idea is that we're going to be looking for the file we want, making the changes, taking that completed changed file, packaging it up, and sending it out to the clients. There are a couple ways to do this, okay? The older, the older style way is through what's called MCX, which is Apple's Managed Preferences System. This is what you would use if you had 10.6 server and you were using uh, uh, Open Directory or Workgroup Manager to control how your users behave and how the computers behave. That was through the MCX system. It still works in 10.7 and 10.8 with some work. It does still work fine, and I still use it now because it's the only way to get consistent, identical behavior from 10.6 through 10.8. In 10.7 and 10.8, they introduced a management scheme called Profiles, which I'm sure most of you are also familiar with as well. Profiles are great. They're like MCX sort of on steroids with a limb removed. We'll go with that. Um, profiles are, you know, they're, they're the new official standard for how things should be managed. Problem is, obviously, they don't work on 10.6. It's 10.7 and above only. So if you have to if you have to manage multiple platforms, like I have, I still have machines running Snow Leopard. Um, it will be a very long time before those machines vanish off the face of the earth and get replaced by nice shiny new ones. As much as I would wish I could just make that happen, um, so I still have to be able to apply the same preferences across multiple different generations of Macs. Um, so profiles just don't work for me as the single ultimate solution. Um, profiles are officially established through the use of Profile Manager, which is a feature in OS X Server now, in 10.7 and 10.8 Server, although I don't recommend using 10.7 Server for anything, ever. Um, 10.8 Server is much better than 10.7. Um, but Profile Manager does require OS X Server, so for those of you who don't have one, um, obviously that option is a little bit less useful. Um, local MCX, or sorry, MCX is something that you can establish on any computer, regardless of what server you have. You don't even need any kind of OS X Server to make it work, which is why I'm a big fan of it. And of course, uh, one other, the obvious, the other obvious method for controlling your Macs is by scripting. If you have a shell script or a Python script or whatever that has the changes you want, you can also have launch daemons and launch agents run these scripts periodically or when a user logs in or on machine startup. So there's a lot of ways we can control these machines. There's a lot of ways we can get preferences across. <coughs> so. Local MCX, okay? There's, there's a way to do managed preferences the way that you used to do from 10.6 server, except locally on the machine. The idea behind this is that we're going to trick the machine into thinking it has a directory server, but it actually is its own directory server. And every machine is going to have the same setting. So all the machines are basically going to be tricked into thinking they have a managed preferences server telling them what to do. And I'll show you how actually easy it is for us to establish this and how easy it is to make changes when we want to deploy this to clients. It sounds like it's complicated, but it really isn't. Um, these guys, Greg Nagel and Ed Marksack, they literally wrote the book on this. Um, this is an amazing resource for just learning about how Mac preferences work. It was written 
right after line came out. So there's a few things that have changed in 10.8, but the general idea still works just the same. Um, and he has updated a lot of the information in that book on his own blog. And if you don't already know about his blog, it's an incredible resource. He is a very brilliant man, full of really brilliant ideas, and he documents them all. I wish we could all be so effective. Um, using local MCX does require a workgroup manager, which is a free download from Apple. It's been installed on all of the, pre, on all the provided laptops here, so we will be able to use it today. Um, <clears throat> it does not require OS X server. Nothing we do here today is going to require OS X server. There's one last piece of the local MCX that is new in Mountain Line that's going to kind of cause us some trouble. And you'll be able to see exactly how it behaves. And this is the new thing called the CF Prefs D, the, the preferences daemon. The way that 10.8 works now is that all applications ask this preferences management service for information about their plists. This service is in charge of keeping track of what file needs to be read, what information should be written, and when. There's, this link I provided tells you about what it does and how it behaves, but the ultimate result for us is that if you make a change to a plist file, you probably won't actually see the file itself change for about 30 seconds. And we'll, you'll be able to test this and see. You can sit there and wait 30 to 40 seconds, and then you'll see the file actually be created and swapped. And this is because of the way the CFPREFS daemons work. 10A also made one other big change. The trick behind local MCX is to create a fake node in directory services that acts as an open directory server. In 10.8, the DSCL command, are you all familiar with, with DSCL? Do you know what it does? OK, so DSCL is the command to control directory services. It's what you would use if you wanted to add user accounts through the command line, if you wanted to change passwords or uh, search through your directory services information. DSCL is the key, and I really recommend reading the man page on it, is, is the key to unlocking all your information about directory services. Um, in 10.8, it only works on default nodes because of sandboxing. We're going to break that. We're going to change that behavior because it's annoying, and I hate it. So workgroup manager, um, we'll get to that a little bit later. All right, so. That's it for the slides for the moment. We're going to come back to this information a little bit. Now we can start doing a little bit more hands-on stuff. I'm going to show you. Excellent. That was fast. OK. All right. On your desktops, you should all see. Oh, why is this asleep? OK. You should all see a folder called MCX settings on, your, on the desktops of the provided computers. Please let me know if you don't see if you don't have that. I believe I copied it to all of them, but just in case. Okay, so the first thing that has to be done, I'm actually gonna move forward slightly. Okay. Oh wait. Wrong input. Okay. This is the general workflow we're gonna use to do local MCX. I've already done some of these steps for you, so you don't have to worry about it. We're going to install the MCX script package, which I've pre-created for you, and I'll show you what it's like. We're going to install Workgroup Manager. We're going to break the sandboxing limitation, and we're going to create a, a hidden admin account to manage our MCX settings. We're going to actually add MCX items. We're going to import it. We're going to export it. We're going to package it. And then from that package, you can distribute it through whatever method you want. That's the general workflow we're going to be using. Okay, so this is the package that I've already installed for you. This package does, very, does a few things. It sets up a launch agent, sorry, a launch daemon that runs every time the machine starts up. It runs this script. You don't really have to read this script. You don't need to worry about it. But basically what this script does is it creates the fake node called MCX. If you open up your terminal, OK, and you can invoke, you'll, you'll probably need to invoke uh, sudo access for this. So if you haven't already, go ahead and type in sudo space dash s. I'm already in the root shell. Actually, I'll just make a new one. Here we go. sudo dash s, and then type in the password, which I believe is Mac user. OK, this gets you a root shell. You'll need root access to do pretty much anything in the directory service nodes. And the directory service nodes are stored in private var db dslocal nodes. 
Okay. And when you see here, here we go. When you get here, you will see we now have two nodes. We have got default and MCX. Default is where all your current system information is stored. Your user accounts, your groups, all the stuff about your account structure is stored in your default node. We're not, oh, I'm sorry, is that too, too, is that better? Bigger, bigger, is that good? Okay, um, so we're not gonna touch default for the most part. We, we don't wanna mess with the current system because it's really easy to go in there and then break everything. Then it'll just be really sad. Um, what, what this script does, basically, is when the machine starts up, it checks to make sure that the MCX node exists, and if it doesn't, it makes it, and then sets all the appropriate settings it needs to for that to, to work. So that part is taken care of by the script. And if you're curious, this is the launch agent that I created. It has my school's name in it, so just ignore that. But um, basically what this means is run this script which is installed by the package every time the machine starts up, run it load. So the script is idempotent, meaning that you can run the script over and over and over again without changing the machine. So if it's already run once, it won't break anything by running it again. So you can run this as many times as you want and it won't kill anything. Um, so every startup, this script will run to make sure the local MCX node is there and it works. It's nice. You can all thank Greg for that one. He made, he made this baby and it's beautiful. And the post slide of this package, loads up the plist into launch daemon and make sure that the launch daemon executes. So does everyone understand that? That the script, the, the package deposits a script and a launch daemon. The launch daemon runs a script at startup and that creates the MCX node. Okay? Straightforward workflow. So we now have this MCX node sitting in our, in our uh, discovery library. So we can look in the MCX node and of course, every node for directory services has four things. Users, groups, computer groups, and computers. The only one we really care about right now is computer groups, and I'll show you why. This MCX node for, so okay, let me actually let me back up a tiny bit. Oh, hello. That's a lot of crap. Here we go. This is the list of all users that exist on the system. This is in the default node. So if you ever want to, so this right here, this plist I've highlighted, this is the current user account. For you guys, it's called Mac user. For this one, it's Mac comp. But this is the, this is the, these are all the user accounts on the machine. Now, obviously, when you look at your login window, you don't see a hundred things in this list. Most of these are hidden. We're not going to worry about that, but, um, this is just where you would see users. And if you wanted to change user level settings, you could go into these plists and you could add MCX controls. And I'll show you how to do that through our tools. Okay. We've got an MCX node. Derp. Okay. Right now, it's empty. We've got nothing in there. So all it does is exist. What we can do now is we can open up Workgroup Manager. It's all on your, all your machines. We can access our, oops, our local node, and we can check it out. So this is Workgroup Manager. How many of you have never seen Workgroup Manager ever before in your lives? Okay. It's a program, it's in your applications folder. It should be, it, you can just, you should be able to do a spotlight search for it, but it, it should already be installed. Please let me know if you run to a machine that isn't, but I think I got them all. Okay. Workgroup Manager has a lot of stuff. Okay. There's a lot of stuff here, and for most of it, we don't need to worry about it at all. Oh, uh, you mean this? Okay. Your address is localhost. You're, you're, you're going to talk to your directory service running on your machine, okay? And the username and password is, should be Mac user, should be the same. I believe it has the correct access. So for me, it's Mac conf. For you guys, it should be Mac user. Good? All right. So this gets you here. Note, up here, it says, oops, we are currently viewing the directory local MCX. We are not authenticated. The directory service... As you can see, we have two things here. We have our local, which is the default node, and we have the MCX that we created ourselves. 
if you look at the local node, it'll complain, you're working the local node. And you know, we can just ignore that. And it will show you, you know, here's the user account that we created. Username UID 501, et cetera, things like that. You can look through any other settings you've got. Again, we're going to avoid the local default node. We don't want to mess with the default settings. That's why we created this extra node for MCX. However, it's going to tell us we're not authenticated. So, okay, let's try and fix that. And I type in this, and you know what? It's going to fail. Do you know why it's going to fail? Because the account that we're using, Mac user, only works for the default node. If we want to be able to change things in the MCX, we have to create an admin account for the MCX node itself. So let's go ahead and do that right now. That's not one. Go ahead and type all these in. I know, it's fun. You know, I actually did provide a script that does it, but, um, oh, you know what? I'll tell you, hold on, one thing. It's actually going to fail again, and I'll show you why. No, no, but this, this is important. This is, what, this, is, this is because of sandboxing, and this is important to learn about because sandboxing will screw everything up. It's great. We love it. <laughs> Wrong. Okay. Why is this failing? Because in 10.8, because of sandboxing, DSCL cannot write to non-local nodes. It's stuck. So what are we going to do? We're going to break out of the sandbox. And we're going to do this by editing one single file. This file is located okay, in system, library, sandbox, profiles, com.apple.opendirectory.sb. Text Wrangler should be installed in all these computers, and I recommend using it, not text edit, to make changes, because text edit likes to make rich text files, and you do not want your system files to have rich text, ever. It's terrible. Yes. System, library, sandbox, profiles. This is one of the only times you're ever going to mess with stuff in system. Normally, I always tell people, don't mess with stuff in system, because that's Apple's. It belongs to Apple. They put it there. They keep it there. We don't want to touch it. I lied. We're doing it this time. So anyway, when you open up this file, com.apple.opendirectory.sb, this is the sandbox information for how the file works, or for how the, the sandbox for DSCL works. We're just going to add one little thing right down here. Right here it says, these are the places we can let Open Directory write to. And right now it only includes default. So we're just going to copy this line completely, paste it in. Yes, yes, unlock. And just change default to, eh, not all of that, MCX. Just like that. That breaks the sandboxing limitation on DSCL. Almost certainly, okay? It's, it's entirely up to Apple what things happen when they put updates. Anything in system is grounds for complete overhaul the moment Apple does anything in software update. So it is entirely possible this will need to be done again. However, this only needs to happen on your admin machine, not your clients, because we're only going to be using Work Commander to make these preferences on the admin machine. In this example, these machines here, this is your admin machine. This is what we're creating the preferences from. So we only need to do this once, really. Your clients don't need to worry about this because the clients will be able to read from the non-default node. They just can't write to it. But it doesn't matter because you don't want your clients changing the preferences anyway, right? Does that make sense to everybody? OK. Are you going to include this stuff in the slides? Short answer, yes. Okay. <laughs> Long answer, yes. I will. Um, <laughs> if you want to be really fancy, where did I put it? There it is. OK. If you want to be really fancy and you want to feel like a total hacker, I'll show you. This is great. 
in your MCX settings folder on your desktop, okay? Or is it maybe just on the desktop itself? Yeah, on the desktop, there is a file called odsandbox.diff. This is a file you created by doing a differentiation between the old sandbox SB file and the new sandbox SB file, and you can use one single command to apply that to your clients, or to your workstation. Everyone looks feeling like a hacker, right? Make sure I get it right. Okay. Okay. Let's look at this file right now. Okay. This is the file right now. I did not save the change. So this is this is the, this is what the file looks like by default from the system. I run the patch command on this diff. Look at that. Oh, I'm such a hacker. They can be command line ninja. All right, so anyway, that's one way of doing it. You can also just edit the file directly if you want. The point is now we have the sandboxing allowing us to make changes in the non-default node. So let's go ahead and go back to work group manager. Sure. Really? Wow. Someone done goofed. Yeah, and again, you can also you can also do this through the if you want to use whatever command line editor like you know VI, Pico, Nano, whatever. You can also edit the file that way. Whatever method you use doesn't matter as long as you get the right text in here. This is the important thing that the MCX node is allowed. All right, so we got that done. Sandboxing has been broken. We now have a much bigger sandbox. Yes. When the machine started up. Because before you came in, I installed this package, which establishes the script that runs on startup that creates the MCX node. I saved us all a lot of time doing that. So yeah, uh, that's why I wanted to show you what it was without actually having to do Because otherwise, it would have to restart. And having 25 people restart together at the same time in a workshop is just asking for disaster to strike. Path for, hmm? path. path for what? The MCX directory is private var db ds local nodes MCX. Okay, so we go back to work group manager. Okay, now, oh sorry, I skipped a step. Now we can create the correct slide. Now we can create the MCX admin account that we can use to modify things. This will now not fail when you type it in. And if it does, I'll be really sad. I don't want to be sad. <laughs> Easier is a little, okay, let me put it this way. The, oh, sorry, you know what? I forgot we gotta start using this for questions. Why don't you go ahead and repeat the question? And I'll tell you, here. I can't reach. Thank you. So go ahead and ask your question again, please. Yes. Bottom, bottom button. All right, just go ahead and ask, and we'll figure it out. That is, a, that is a great question. No, it's a really important question. And, I, and I'll give you the answer, the spiel I've been preparing all, all night. I've been thinking about this one, all right? There are profiles and there's MCX, okay? Profile Manager is the official Apple method for changing these settings. Um, I'll talk a bit more about profiles in a little bit, but um, I do not suggest that you do not use profiles. Profiles are great. The one big problem is that Profile Manager is terrible. Profile Manager does not give you anywhere close to the functionality you get from Workgroup Manager. Okay, Workgroup Manager has all these all this stuff left over from when it was an open directory management system. Okay, and it still works in 10.8. So you can use Profile Manager to enroll your machines in Profile Manager, push out profiles directly that way. But Profile Manager again, it's limited. Almost everybody who's had to use it will will, will agree that it's buggy. It's crashy, 
from a never before booted OS X server Mac Mini, 20 minutes into using Profile Manager, the machine exploded, and I had to redo the whole thing from scratch. And that's just my personal, I mean, just my personal experience. Other people will have the same one. Now, hmm? sure, you absolutely can. You absolutely can. What I'm trying to accomplish with this, the method that I like to use, is completely agnostic of any directory services or other infrastructure you've got. I want to have a system that I can control completely without having to rely on other servers and other services being in the way. A local MCX implementation is a, a method for you to completely control your Mac without having to rely on these structures. It's independent of my network infrastructure. I can change from OD to AD to OpenLDAP to whatever I want. It's not affected. I can completely change to a completely new network structure, new VLANs and everything. It's not affected. It still works because it's local to the machine. And once we get into it, I'll show you why it's really easy for me to deploy changes. In the future, which is the important thing, once I go through the work now, when I ever have to make something happen later on down the line, it's a single few steps for me. I make the change in Workgroup Manager, I take the plist, I package it, send it into Monkey or whatever other deployment system I've got, it's done. And again, I don't have to worry about the server. I don't have to worry about making changes on a server I may not have access to or may not have control over. In education, a lot of people usually, we have, you know, the people who are in charge of the Macs are also often in charge of the network or server infrastructure because we often have to wear multiple hats in education. Some of you may be lucky enough to have that. Some of you may work in more corporate structures where you don't have access or control over your network structures like that. I don't want to have to ask anyone for permission to do my job. My job is to manage the client max. And this method lets me do that completely independent of everybody else. And like I said, it does work in 10.6, 10.7, and 10.8, which I need in my environment because I'm still stuck with 10.6 machines. And I know for a fact it can be used across all of them equally. The same method works on each of those three computers, 10.6 and 7.10.8. Profiles won't. So if, you, if you're blessed enough to have only new stuff, profiles are great. And we're going to talk about profiles. They're absolutely wonderful tools. Um, but profiles are limited in many ways compared to MCX. It is not clear if Apple will eventually extend Profile Manager or Profiles in general to accommodate all the same things MCX does. Okay? That, you know, again, we all know that remains to be seen. In 10.9, when the, when, the, when the developer seed comes out at WWDC, most likely, we'll all be in a rush to test it. I'll be the first one to line up. You know what I'll be testing, right? I'll be making sure this still works. And if it doesn't, I have to change everything, again, because Apple loves that. Um, but we just don't know what's going to happen in the future. If Profile Manager suddenly inherits all of this stuff, and I have the ability to do all this in Profile Manager directly, then I'm totally going to use it, because it's great. But they might not. MCX might still work in 10.9. It might not. We just don't know. I do know it works right now, and I know that I, you know the computers I'm going to buy right now will, are not going to have 10.9 on them. They might in August, they might in September. I don't know. But with anything, we have to be flexible. But this is a tr this is a technique that is guaranteed to work on the machines in my environment, and it, and I can guarantee it with with the right preparation will work in your environment as well. Because again, it's agnostic of any other directory services, network infrastructure, servers, etc. It allows you control. Your way, or my way, I guess. And since I'm in charge of this workshop, we're doing it my way. <laughs> no, so does that answer your question? Okay. Does anybody, does everybody else, you know, understand the idea behind the, the, why we're doing it this way? I know, you know, MCX is kind of a matter of some debate because it is, in many ways, deprecated, or at least people think it might be deprecated. Apple hasn't stated that, but it looks like it might be. But until it is, it's an effective technique, and we can still use that plus other tools to get the goals we want. You should never limit yourself to just one tool. It's one of many tools in our toolbox we can use to manage these things. All right. Speech over. Workgroup manager. What? Yes. Yes, we do. That is correct. Have you? Wah, wah, wah. Oh, yeah, you have to kill all open directory D. Okay, oh, sorry. This whole multi monitor thing is just driving me crazy. All right. This only has to be done on our admin. This only has to be done once on your admin machine. Okay, 
After you've made the change to the sandbox file, you have to type in this command, kill open directory D. Why? Because that kills open directory service, makes it reload the sandbox settings and all the information about open directory, and then restarts the service, and then you can type in, and it didn't fail. It didn't fail. Presence for everyone. Now you can type these in and they won't fail. That works too. It's on your desktop. You can copy and paste the commands if you want. Um, you can also run the script. Oh, I hate this thing. There's also a script called create MCX admin account, which just has these commands in it. You can run that too if you want, whichever you prefer. The important thing is, all right, I'm just going to go ahead and do this. Okay, when I set GID 80, does anybody understand what that means? Do you know why I set GID 80? Admin accounts are all in the group ID 80. It was correctly guessed, and we were lucky that it's correct, making any account with GID 80 makes it administrative. It inherits the group permissions for administrators. So by making an MCX account with GID 80, it becomes an admin for this node, which is great. I love when things just work like magic. Until the magic breaks. That's not so much fun. Okay. And then the last part is the password. I'm just going to set the password to MCX admin because whatever. Doesn't matter. You're the one person who's ever going to use it ever. No other machine will ever see it. It's not even invisible to the network. So you can set the password to whatever you want. Probably not blank. I don't know what I don't know what that would do. It would probably fail. Okay, so I now have my glorious new MCX password. If I look in where am I? Okay. If I look in users, you can see that account shows up now because it's a user in the MCX node. Is that clear? Alright, we created the user. Now we go to work group manager. And now I can finally use MCX admin. It's authenticated. Time for celebrations. All right. Now we can finally start creating preferences. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to make a new computer group for each preference we want to change. Let's just start with a nice easy example. Let's change the energy settings of these computers because they're annoying me already. There's one more important step. Yes, save. The computers listed in, the way that this trick works, the computers listed in this setting uh, involve what's called a local laptop and a local desktop. If you want to have different settings for laptops than you do for desktops, you could change the membership to include only one of these two groups. In this case, they're all laptops, so we can actually just kind of ignore that. I'm just going to include both and just, yeah. There's information about that in the links and in the, in the book that I recommended on, on the slides. So I recommend looking at those links for more information about what these details mean. This is established by the script that we ran earlier, the MCX script. All right, so now we can get to the real fun part. We're going to start finally changing some of the settings around, okay? So you can click on Preferences and Work Group Manager. You can look at the Energy Saver, and this is what you see when you open up the Energy Saver panel, right? We can manage these controls the way that we want. So I'm on, I'm, let's say it's a port, this is, a, so this is a desktop. Yours are going to be portable, so you're going to make sure you want to work on the portable section, okay? When it's plugged in, I always want to manage it for maximum performance, or you can just say, let's do custom. Don't ever sleep. Display goes away after 20 minutes. Don't put the hard drive down. I can also schedule, start it up every time at a certain day, whatever, things like that. You've got those options. This might be slightly confusing because, again, this is a desktop and those are laptops, so any changes I make to the laptops aren't going to work on mine, but they'll work on yours. So anyway, this is, let's just say we're going to do this one setting. We're going to make it so that these machines never go to sleep. Done. If you look now, inside the computer groups, there's our plist. There's the changes that we made, okay? If you look very carefully in the details section, you can actually see the files that are affected. If you double click on it, it will show you changes that you've made to the actual plists that exist. And this, this expands to everything here. Everything you see here is what Worker Manager provides. 
What I'm going to show you is that there's a lot more you can do than what Workgroup Manager provides. If you go into details and you click on the little plus sign down here, let's actually let's make a new group first. Stuff. Let's add the members, save, preferences, plus sign. Okay, there is a wonderful little tool in system, library, core services, scrolling down, scrolling down, manage client. If you add this to your MCX settings, you can see a whole lot of things suddenly open up that you can now control. The manage client app in the, in the core services is basically just a giant bundle of preferences for you to play with. Okay, and if you click on any of these, you can see the kind of things that you can do with it. Right now, this thing is totally empty. If we add a key, okay, we can specify it. If you, if you click on, okay, let me try that again. If you add a key and you click on the little arrows next to it, you'll see what items it has available for you to go ahead and fill out. So let's say I want to make sure the background of all these computers is something that I want it to be. Oops, let's change this to library desktop pictures. Uh, let's do something simple, circles, because it's a nice one letter word. Okay, now we can change this to reflect that this is the background picture. Save. Okay. The next time this account logs in, I don't want to demonstrate on my machine because that would require logging out and that would just be a waste of time. Or if you reboot your machines, after you've made this change, you'll see it happen. You know what? We can actually do something even cooler. We can do this right now by making an account. Oh, of course. This can also be managed through MCX. You can turn this off. I didn't. Circles! See? So this is just one way. I'm just showing you. You can make these changes. You put them in the MCX, and right there, it's immediate. It, it's reflected by the change. The changes you've made are reflected immediately in new accounts you create. And, you know, this applies to, you know, again, energy settings. If I, let's see if I actually did it to portable or desktop. There you go. Settings have been changed for me. These have been provided by my MCX settings. So right now, unless, you know, since I'm not an admin user in this account, I can't change these. These have been done for me. And that's all through local MCX. So we got that part done. That's nice and easy. And now we want to make sure we can get these out to the rest of our clients, okay? So again, the computer groups now has the two things that we've created, the background setting and the energy settings plists. We can take those and make a package out of it. What are we going to use? This wonderful little tool called packages, which should also be installed on all the machines. It should be in the applications folder. Let me know if it isn't. OK. So if you've never used packages before, it's actually really, I think, really intuitive. Um, you just go ahead and pick a raw package. Let's call this energy settings. We're going to say, oh, let's just save this on the desktop, because why not? Finish. Why does it want my contacts? I don't even know. OK. So this is the little package that we've got that we're going to create. OK, we can kind of name the identifier or whatever. The identifier is um, important. Because this is what this is what the name of the receipt that gets left behind uh, in the Mac. So every time you look at the list of installed packages in the system profiler or through the package util command, um, this is what will show up in the list of installed packages. So you probably want to name it something appropriately useful. Um, so we can just call it edu dot psu test dot package dot energy settings etc. Payload. The payload is going to be the file right here, the energy settings. 
To make it easy on ourselves, we'll just copy that energy settings. Oops. Okay, my desktop now has a whole lot of other crap. Here we go. Here's that playlist I just created. We can, we're gonna, we're gonna want to put that file in the same place we got it from. But oops, not that. You control click or right click, you make a new folder, var. This is the one downside of this process. db. ds, oh, you know what? I failed at life. It's private var. Private var db ds local. It, it does, but it will not recreate the path. So we will be dragging the file in, but it won't create the path structure for you. Okay, so it's going to be, oh, this whole resolution thing is killing me here. Wow, that's helpful. All right, let's do it manually. DS local nodes. MCX computer groups. Now you can drag and drop if the windows don't all get in the way because the resolution is 1024 by 768. Okay, we can go ahead and keep all the settings and remember, the important thing is that everything in DS local and down has to be owned by root with the group wheel. And you most definitely want your settings to only be read, read and written to root. Nobody else should ever have access to this. Nobody else should even be able to get to these folders except for root. This is a root stuff only. So we just copied it directly. So all those, per, all those permissions are preserved. So don't have to worry about that, but something to keep in mind. All right. So this is just a simple package. All it delivers is this payload right here into that same folder that we copied it out from. That's literally all it takes. We're going to save. We are going to build. It's done. I'm going to minimize all these windows. Here is my package. Now, just to show you that it works. Where am I? It's gone. It's been deleted. It's not there. It's going to complain. Well, work group manager is going to complain until I re-log in. Nah. That's not what I wanted. Yeah, we'll close. Oh. No, well, it still thinks it's there for some reason. That's weird. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, the file itself is actually gone. Now, if you just go ahead and run the package. It's back. Okay? So what we did right there, we made a change to the energy settings in Workgroup Manager. We copied it out, that P list that we made. We made a package out of it that deposits it to the exact same place. And when you run that package, it just installs it. And if local MCX is installed, it's just going to work. The next time this service reboots, or the next time a user logs out and MCX refreshes, it'll work. You guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. OK, does that, does everyone understand what just happened? All right, good, mind blowing. Now, let's switch gears a little bit, all right? That's how local MCX works. It's beautiful. What if, oh, I don't have a slide for it. All right, we are going to talk about profiles now because profiles are very similar to MCX with a few caveats. When you use Profile Manager to create profiles or when you use any, any standard, you know, like configurator or any other utility that creates profiles, okay? In MCX, you can choose three kinds of options for how you want this to be enforced. Once, often, always. Once, meaning you provide a set of defaults, and that's what it happens, and users can change it. Often means you reapply it every time a user logs in. It gets reapplied on logout. 
always means that you strictly enforce it so the user can never change at any point. You will discover for yourself, not all things work always, often, once. Most things work once. Not everything will work always. Not everything will work often. That's just a matter of experimentation. That's kind of irrelevant for the, for the point of this talk. Profiles are always enforced, period, always. You establish anything in a profile, you install the profile, that is law. It cannot be changed until you uninstall the profile. It is, that's it, okay? We can use a tool, however, a nice helpful script that has been provided somewhere, oh geez, on my desktop. We can use a nice little script written by Timothy Sutton called MCX to profile. This should already be in the MCX settings folder on your desktop. Um, so let me know if it isn't. <clears throat> what this little Python script does, pretty obvious. It converts an MCX plist to a profile. Okay, so. There it is, okay. Let's take, well, first off, okay, this script, do, 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 do. I have it written here somewhere. Or no, I don't, whatever, doesn't matter. All right, the help section of this script tells you how to use it, okay? We need a few simple things, we need We obviously need to specify the plist, right? So we're going to use the energy settings plist that we just created. I'm going to kneel if you don't mind. plist equals desktop. We need the identifier. This is exactly the same identifier that we have right here. Okay, it's the name, it's the identifier of the package that is the, that the receipt that gets left behind when we install the package. So let's just go ahead and copy that out. And then, um, we do want to allow uninstallation. So this, this package can be removed without any problems. So let's go ahead and say removal allowed. That's not what I want. And, that's pretty much all that, man, that all that matters. Here's the one fun part. The one thing you can do MCX to profile that you can't do with regular profiles. You can specify once, often, or always. Profile default is going to be always. If you want to change it so that it's only a one-time change, you can do that with this. You cannot do it with Profile Manager. That is a limitation of, profile, of profiles in general. You cannot set it by default to once or often. It's going to be always. In this case, I'm not going to worry about it. We're just going to go ahead and use always. Wah, wah. I had a typo somewhere. Where is, where is my typo? Oh, that's why. All right, what did I do wrong here? You were correct. Wait, no. You were incorrect. Fire. That made everything really weird. Oh, because there should be a space, not dashes, or not equal. No, nope, I was wrong. I apparently did not sacrifice enough things to the demo gods today. Take this one out. Yeah, that's correct. Oh, you know what? That's why. Okay, I needed to use administrative privilege because the plist is owned by root, and I was not running this as an admin. All right, so yeah, if I run this here, 
it'll work just fine. Okay, what this creates, where is it? Here it is. This is the mobile.config, the mobile config file, which is a profile, okay? Has anybody here ever had to manage iOS devices? Okay, you, so you, you know what profiles are, right? Like, so it, it's always a dot mobile config file. The nice thing is that in 10.7 and 10.8, profiles work across iOS and OS 10 for the most part. Some things can be managed, some things can't, but they're all the same kind of profile file. Now, the nice thing about profiles is they're really easy to use. The simplest thing you can do is double click your profile. Syst system profiles opens and says, hey, do you want to install this? And you're like, sure. I didn't sign this, so it's going to ask me, are you sure you want to do this? Yes, let's go ahead and do it. There we go. That's my profile. It's installed. You can just double click it and it works. That's the nice thing about profiles. Now, you see here, it actually tells you what this profile does. So here's all the, the crap that we, you know, that we loaded into that plist. So, um, that's nice. And also, if you look in the system profiler, There it is. So profiles are installed, all right? I'll show you how to package this. Now, here's another important thing about using both profiles and local MCX. You can have both. They can affect the same setting. Guess what happens? No one has any idea. That behavior is undefined if you have MCX and profiles trying to do the same thing. Who knows what you'll get out of it? So, you know, be, be, be wary about setting up these kind of controls without very clearly understanding which ones you're using for which. Now, there's another couple of limitations for profiles, okay? MCX to profile, it's a wonderful script. Some things that profile manager does, MCX to profile can't, sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. You can do a lot of things with profile manager. I can't show you because profile manager is not turned on in this machine and then it will take a million years to set it up. You can do a lot of things with profile manager. You can create equivalent profiles using MCX to profile. They won't always work. Profiles you create this way generally won't work if Profile Manager can already do it. So this will really only work for things that Profile Manager can't do on its own. So a good example of this would be uh, uh, the Finder sidebar. If you want to change the way that the sidebar looks when you open up a window, okay? These settings, this is all managed by MCX. This can all be managed in a plist, okay? All these files right here. So you can change all this in MCX, you can change all this with a profile. This will work if you use MCX to profile, because Profile Manager can't do this. Energy settings, they might not work. I haven't actually tested it with Profile Manager yet, but if it just doesn't do anything, then you'll understand, oh, okay, Profile Manager owns that, that setting. I can't mess with that. Is that clear? So again, a lot of this is gonna come down to experimentation. When you're sort of working on your lab construction, when you're working on setting up all these controls you wanna use, you have to really experiment and test, test, test does this setting work the way I want it to? If I deploy it to clients, do they get it? And um, yeah, you're just gonna have to play with it. Yes? Yeah, that'll work, yeah. It's just if you have a profile that you've created using MCX2 profile specifically, and Profile Manager owns it, the profile will probably just get ignored. No, no. If you're doing it through MCX, that's a different mechanism. MCX is obeyed no matter what, unless you fail the script or something like that. But the profile, if you use the profile to install that setting, but Profile Manager doesn't want you, doesn't want to let you do that, it'll just ignore your profile. It just won't do anything. The profile will be installed, and you can see it's installed, and it'll be like, I don't understand. I have this profile installed, but it doesn't do anything. That's probably why. So. Again, it's one, that's again, oh, well, she left. That's again one of the reasons why I would advocate the use of multiple tools to accomplish your goals, because you can use all of these together to get the results you want. All right, so we have a profile. I showed you how to make, how to use packages to make this nice little payload for delivering these MCX. If you don't want to use MCX or you just want to make a profile out of this, let's do that too. Let's make a new package. Profiles, unlike MCX, you can put a profile anywhere. What we're going to do is we're going to invoke a command on the command line called profiles, user bin profiles, which is actually in the path. 
derp. Well, okay. So, profiles has a nice little man page, um, and it tells you all the things that, pro that the profiles commands will do. You can just do man profiles, and you can get all the nice details here. Um, so I recommend reading the man page at some point in the future. The important thing that we need to use is we're going to use dash i, meaning we're going to install this profile for the system level from this file we've got. And dash f is obviously we're going to specify the path to the file, that we're, the profile that we're going to load up. Okay? So, I'm going to delete this profile first. So now we've got no profiles installed. If we go to the system preferences and refresh it, well, whatever, I'll figure it out. Okay. That's not what I want. I want this one. Yeah, it doesn't matter. We'll use this one. Wah, wah. Let's try the other one then. Wah, wah, wah. All right, well, this machine is not set up the way I expected it to be for profiles. So, all right, I'm going to pretend that demo didn't just fail completely. Um, what we're going to do normally is make a file for our Whoops. Let's delete it. Let's make that wrap. Normally, I wouldn't recommend setting on wrap, but just to make it easy for us to read. Actually, here, I can just solve that problem the easier way. OK. This is going to be our post flight. We're going to save this right there. Oh, I saved a different one, didn't I? Where did I save this? Oh, yeah. Okay. We're just going to go ahead and overwrite this one here in Energy Settings Profile. And then we're here going to set the post installation post flight script to be the one that we just created. We're going to save, we're going to build. It's probably going to fail. Just let you know. We'll find out. And it failed. Yeah, that's what I thought. All right. Anyway, in a perfect world, it would have been just fine. Everything would have been great, and everybody would be cheering right now. Yay! All right. So, um, in the interest of time, all right. The important thing is, we found, th we figured out how we can use Workgroup Manager to make these settings. We can take these settings, put them into a package, deploy it however you want to your clients. And as long as you deploy that MCX script package first, anything you put into the local MCX will just work. You can convert it to a profile. You can use Profile Manager. You can use Configurator. You can use iPhone Configuration Utility. Any tool like Jamf, uh, Jamf Casper Suite can also make profiles that will work on OS X. You can use that to generate profiles. You can take those profiles, put them into a package, and deploy that as well. The important thing is that all these methods we used to control the Mac to change these settings, they can be packaged up and delivered easily. And the reason why, the really, the big important reason why I stress that we keep making all these separate computer groups for it is that you want to have each preference, each profile only affect one thing. 
So that way, if you want to make a change, you only have to install one package. You don't have to worry about everything else, right? You don't want to have one big profile that has all of your settings. Because if you want to make one change, you have to replace the profile that has all of your settings. There's always a possibility for things going wrong when you do that. So the more, that, the more granular you make it, the more finely detailed you separate out your preferences, the better control you've got. So let's say on the machines in my lab, okay, I control the finder behavior, the sidebar, the dock, the background, the screensaver, energy settings. Okay, these are machines being used by kindergartners through eighth graders, all of whom have their own special brand of terror that they will inflict upon these poor innocent souls or machines. Okay, and they will all try as hard as they can to ruin everything. If you don't manage the dock, if you leave the dock unlocked, one day you show up and you've got Safari, Firefox, Word, etc. The next day you show up, you've got puppy pictures all over your dock and it's on the right side of the screen and it's this small or this big and it's just a mess. And then all the kids get it frustrated. It wastes class time when you have to fix all these things. You don't want to deal with that in an educational institution. All these things are in separate computer groups. All these things I've managed are in separate MCX groups. Every single time I want to make a single change to one of them, I drop that package into Monkey, the client machines pick it up, it installs, it works. It's, it's a simple workflow once you get past the initial setup. I mean, it seemed like, I know, like, this is a workshop. This is a lot of information for me to dump on you guys in 70 minutes. And I kind of wish I had done a two-hour, you know, the longer session one. But um, again, the thing I want to stress is you have granular control with these tools. You have the ability to finally determine what you want to change, how you want to change it at your convenience agnostic of any settings, not having to worry about any servers, infrastructure, things like that. It's all up to you. Question? So, active is active. That's good. Right. If it's a local account, yes. Now, if you're using like, right, if you're using, you know, mobile homes, network users, the rules change a little bit when you use like, you know, mobile homes and network users because, um, so, okay, how many of you have ever messed with a user template as a way to get settings across? All right, good. So, well, somewhat good. Right. Right. Yes. And I'll tell you why. User templates only work one time only on local users. You, if you've got network users with mobile homes, they're not going to be affected by changes you make to the user template. If you have users already existing on your machines and you want to make a change, that's not going to help the users you already have. So if you're going to use that as your method of changing how user accounts behave, okay, they get one chance. If you change your mind later, that means after you've made a change to the user template, you have to go back and change the user accounts anyway. Right? So if you say, all right, from now on, the dock is only going to be on the left for everybody from now on, forever. If you already have user accounts that exist that don't have that setting, they have to be changed somehow. That's a pain in the butt. It's a waste of time. Why do that when you can have a mechanism that makes all accounts respect it equally, regardless of whether they're new or old? Right? You don't have to reinvent the wheel when you want to make changes that way. So that's why I, I'm a huge fan of modular strategies for making these changes. This lets you layer on the pieces that you want so that you end up with delicious cake. Yes? It can. MCX can control that. That actually is an MCXable thing. Now, again, not everything is. For some things that you can't control, scripting. Seriously. You know, if you can figure out how to make the change that you want or make the application behave with Python, shell scripts, bash, you know, whatever, Ruby, you know, whatever you got, you can make launch daemons that will run at the user login that make the changes you want. You can script those. I mean, it, it, again, this isn't the end-all, be-all solution for every single thing ever. For example, one thing that annoys me to absolutely no end for many reasons is airdrop. Okay? Herb. All right, airdrop, okay? This setting in the sidebar, everything that you see right here can be controlled through MCX except AirDrop. It can't. You cannot make AirDrop go away using MCX or profiles. 
because it's stored in a separate place in a separate key. The key only exists when AirDrop is enabled. When AirDrop is disabled, the key is deleted. So I can't force a key to not exist. I can't make a key not exist in a plist. So the only way I can fix this is through scripting. I have to have a script that runs on login if I care that much to make it go away. And you know what? After struggling with this for like a week, I wanted to care. I care. I made it go away and I felt great. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that can be posted online. Yeah. <laughs> That's MCXable. Yes, there are two settings you can make go the, the did see cloud setup and someone remember, remind me. There's one more. There's one, there's one more setting, uh, that, that controls. Did I see the iCloud setup and, uh, the, the gesture, the lion gesture screen that comes up? Those can all be gotten rid of with MCX. All right. I'm out of time. The clock went down. I'm gone. So again, dang it. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. All right. This here is the ultimate workflow. You prep your machines. You install the OS. You, ch you put your settings on there. You test that it works, you deploy it. Everything that you learned here today, you use all these processes, you have a single workflow that you take your machines, you process them, you give them off, and it works. Thanks, guys.